Hi, and welcome to Punished for Protecting. I am here live today with a very special guest, Barry Goldstein. Barry is a domestic violence expert. He is the director of research for the Stop Abuse Campaign. Today we are on location at VCS with Barry, and he is also the co-author of three books, and he is the author of two books. I'd like to welcome you, to welcome the audience today to our guest, Barry Goldstein. Thank you. I'm looking forward to our discussion today, and I really want to thank VCS, which is an organization in Rockland County that, among other things, runs one of the New York Model Batterer programs in which I have been an instructor for the past 18 years. Wow, that's amazing, Barry. Um, Barry, I'd like to talk to you today about um, ACE, Saunders, and Meyer. Could you tell the audience about that? Yes, you know, we're in a really exciting period right now because we now have the research that confirms what protective mothers have been saying for decades, that the custody court system is broken, it's in crisis, and that a large majority of contested custody cases result in the children being sent to live with dangerous abusers. And hopefully we can use this research to change practices that frankly are not working. Um, if you want, I can start with the ACE research. And this may be one of the most exciting pieces of medical research that we have seen perhaps since the Surgeon General's report that link cancer with smoking. Because the thing is that that research gave us an opportunity to change practices that had been going on for decades. And in changing those practices, we were saving thousands of lives, billions of dollars, and most important, improving the quality of life. <clears throat> the ACE research, which comes from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, offers a similar opportunity. Um, what it does, it looked at 10 adverse childhood experiences, hence ACE, A-C-E, um, that children sometimes are exposed to. And what they found is that children who are exposed to domestic violence, child abuse, and other traumas will live shorter lives and have more illness and injury and social problems throughout their lives. So it is hugely consequential, and part of the problem in the custody courts is they're not taking it as seriously as they need to. And one of the most important findings in ACE is that the largest harm and risk to children is not the physical injuries which the courts and society tend to focus on, but it is living with the fear which causes the worst kind of stress, and that leads to all of these problems. You know, and if you think about it, our present level of cancer and heart disease and diabetes and mental illness and suicide and crime um, and uh, all sorts of harmful behaviors and illnesses is connected with our present level of domestic violence and child abuse. What that means is that if we use the ACE research to take more effective responses to domestic violence and child abuse, which of course means the custody courts have to stop protecting abusers and instead protect children, we will dramatically reduce these scourges on society and we're going to have far better lives and we are going to save a fortune. Well, today, the United States spends over a trillion dollars every year 
to tolerate men's abuse of women. Most of that expense is on um, health care costs, although crime costs is also a big part of it. And we can stop that. And in case your uh, viewers are interested, that comes to about $3,000 for every man, man, woman, and child in this country. So everybody has a personal interest mm -hmm. in preventing domestic violence. I absolutely agree. And I'm working with thousands of victims across our nation. Uh, right now we're in Rockland County, but I, one of my target areas is Ulster County, which you were on actually my trial. And right. We were practically begging them to protect my son, and no, they didn't hear it. Uh, my question to you is, even aside from domestic violence and drug addiction in the home where a child is um, uh, you know, around that atmosphere, um, let's pretend that doesn't exist in a home. Ripping a child from a primary caretaker causes extensive damage. Did you want to elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah, um, primary attachment is not a controversial issue. The parent who provided most of the child care during the first two years of the child's life is and always will be the child's primary attachment figure. That means that when the child is denied a normal relationship with his or her primary parent, that child is at significant risk of depression, low self-esteem, and suicide when older. And again, I think that the courts usually understand that there is some harm in separating children from their primary attachment figure, but I don't think they f understand the full harm that it risks. Could you elaborate a little bit more about some of that harm? Because I know that that's, that's that, that the harm is the what business. I said, yeah. the suicide, the depression, the low self-esteem. Um, one, of, one of the common problems in custody courts is that they will often retaliate against protective mothers who they believe are making false reports or you know claims of alienation and so they create what the Saunders study called harmful outcome cases. These are extreme decisions in which a safe protective mother not only loses custody to the alleged abuser, but is limited to supervised visits or no visits. The Saunders study, which comes from the National Institute of Justice in the U.S. Justice Department, found that these decisions, which are all too common in family courts that are using the outdated practices, this decision is always wrong. It's always wrong because the harm of denying children a normal relationship with their primary attachment figure is greater than whatever benefit the court thought it was providing. That's been something that's been of great interest to so many of us is why they're making these decisions in the first place. Uh, that they would actually place a child, even if they're claiming that a mother is lying about abuse, taking a child, I feel, is personally abusing the child by taking them from that primary attachment figure. And you've just basically stated that now. And also you're saying that it's, uh, I know it's one of the largest studies ever conducted by the medical field, or is that correct? Or The ACE study yeah. was one of the largest the studies, and there have been um, five additional studies um, that have replicated the results um, and have confirmed the findings of the original ACE study um, and expanded on it. And, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, what are some of your solutions to these outrageous problems that we're all facing across our you know, entire country in regards to our children and their children's lives being endangered and placed at risk? Well, what I did is I put together the research like ACE and like Saunders to come up with an evidence-based approach that would focus on protecting children instead of protecting abusers. And, and it might be helpful to put, it, put this in context. Um, the modern movement to end domestic violence really started in the mid to late 1970s. And at that time, there was no research 
about domestic violence. And courts had to figure out how do we respond to domestic violence cases. And at the time, there was a popular assumption that domestic violence was caused by mental illness or substance abuse, and that led courts to turn to mental health professionals as if they were the experts in domestic violence. We now have substantial research that demonstrates that that was a mistake, that abusers do not commit domestic violence because of mental health reasons. They commit it because of their sense of entitlement, their belief in their own superiority, their belief that they're entitled to make the decisions in the relationship. But that wasn't the basis of how courts originally came up with practices in the 1970s. We now have substantial research that would make the work of family courts so much easier, but the courts have been really slow to integrate this research. You know, the first ACE study was uh, released in 1998, the Saunders study was released in 2012, and we're still waiting for them to integrate this knowledge. And the lack of knowledge, the lack of research is not neutral. It favors abusers. It's why abusers are able to manipulate the courts and hurt children. And I think one other piece of context before we get into the Safe Child Act is most custody cases, like all other court cases, are settled more or less amicably. The problem that we have in the family courts is about 3.8% of all the cases that go to trial and usually far beyond. The courts have been taught to treat these as high conflict, by which they mean that the parents are angry at each other and act out in ways that hurt the children. The research demonstrates that a very large majority of these cases are really domestic violence cases in which the worst abusers, men who believe that she has no right to leave, are using the courts and manipulating the courts to regain control when she tries to leave. And the courts don't understand the kind of cases they're dealing with. These contested cases, these are the most dangerous. Mm -hmm. These are cases where people die, where children die, where women die, and they're not taking it as seriously as they need to. They're so anxious to keep fathers in children's lives because so many other fathers abandon children that they force it to work with fathers that are totally inappropriate. And at that same time, and I can speak as a survivor, they eliminate the mother completely from the ch life of the child, which to me is a complete conundrum of what is happening. They re-victimize the mother, um, and they re-victimize the child in this, in this thought process that they have. And then to top that all off, um, that is actually giving an abuser carte blanche to continue to abuse a child. Yeah, what we have seen, and one of the reasons that domestic violence experts really understand the situation better than the other professionals is that we look for patterns. And what we have seen over and over again is there's an alleged domestic violence case. The courts give custody to the father based on their prediction that the father is more likely to promote the relationship with the mother. And we know that that's not the case, that the whole purpose of seeking custody is to take the mother out of the child's life, is to punish the mother for reporting his abuse. So as soon as they gain control, they use a variety of tactics to destroy the relationship with the mother. And the courts that are so anxious to come down on mothers with any hint of alienation theories, which is really often mislabeled, um, and they, they do nothing as the father actually 
alienates the child from the mother and takes her out of the child's life. They don't realize that the father's response confirms the previous complaint that the father is an abuser. Well, in my, I can say this wholeheartedly and from all my experience and myself and thousands of mothers across our nation are being completely alienated from their children. Their children are being completely alienated from them. They're losing their primary caretakers. They're losing their primary counselors. They're, the mothers are being completely ostracized and not allowed to um, speak to a doctor any longer that the child has been going to for years or a counselor any longer. They're not allowed to go to the schools. They're being arrested and put in jail. They're getting orders of protection uh, placed against them repeatedly, and they're just refiling. They're not even filing for them. They're just reinstating orders of protection against mothers. Sounds to me like it's not just the abuser that's abusing these mothers. It sounds like the judges might be doing some of this abuse. What is your take on that? Well, there's a term for what you described. It's called domestic violence by proxy. And what is really going on here? And because courts are not looking at patterns, they're not seeing it. <coughs> and that is that the abuser engaged in a pattern of abuse during the relationship. When the mother tries to leave, uh, tries to protect her children, the father counters with you know claims of custody, um, claims of alienation, and is getting away with it. He is seeking to take children out of the mother's life because that is the best way he can punish her for leaving. Initially, he may hope that the risk of losing the child will cause the mother to go back to him. In a number of cases, the father is also abusing the children, and I know many mothers who went back to their abuser, took his beatings so that the child would not be assaulted or raped. It's a really horrific situation, and the courts are just not understanding what is going on. And, you know, the thing is, we have this really important research, ACE, Saunders, and a new study by Joan Meyer, and courts could use that to understand what's going on, but the problem is, for 40 years, they've been doing the wrong thing, listening to the wrong people, and they're not open to the idea that they've been making mistakes all this time that have caused horrific suffering for the children. Horrific suffering for the children. <coughs> There's no question about that. Um, and I do want to state for the sake of the audience that we are, we are pro-family. We are pro-mother and father. We are pro-fathers that are healthy and stable and fit and protective. Um, this is not a one-sided th argument. There is extensive research and study and, and statistics that are proving what Barry is speaking of. And Barry, how many mother? How, what's the percentage of mothers that report abuse uh, that are actually lying, or I hope I'm asking this correctly, or that are uh, in, in, in connection to the in, in uh, correlation to the amount of mothers that are telling the truth? And how many are treated like they're lying? There, there is um, important research called the Ballas study, which is really putting together about a dozen or more different studies that has the definitive information about the frequency that mothers and fathers involved in child custody disputes um, make deliberate false reports. What they found is that mothers make deliberate false reports less than 2% of the time. But fathers involved in contested custody are 16 times more likely to lie about abuse reports than mothers. And just let's stop and think about that, and let's, let's be realistic. Because I have to tell you that when I first saw that statistic, it seemed off. Mm -hmm. I could certainly imagine that mothers are more honest than fathers, but there's no way that mothers are 16 times more honest than fathers. But that's not what the Ballas study said. You have to understand the context. We're talking about contested custody cases. As we said a moment ago, these are overwhelmingly domestic violence cases involving the worst abusers. Those men 
are the ones who are more likely to make deliberate false reports. And again, the courts are hugely skeptical about reports by mothers, which are almost never false. <coughs> they are not skeptical about reports from fathers. They're not skeptical about denials from fathers, which are even more likely to be false. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the gender bias mm -hmm. that we see in the courts that, again, the courts are not recognizing. I can vouch for that 100%. And also, um, I noticed that these courts, and I've court watched not just in New York State, Ulster County, but in several other states, and I see the same thing. They're not allowing evidence into the court. And if they see evidence, that's actual evidence, they are ignoring that completely. Completely. They're not even letting it come in onto the record. That's been one of our major problems right there. Yeah, I've, I've been concerned that it appears in a lot of cases judges who have made a bad decision do not want to put on the record information that would undermine their previous decision. They, they, yeah, they don't. They, I guess they feel that their ego is more important than the safety of a child and the welfare of a child and the risks that are involved. Um, another uh, issue that I see, well, that I wanted to ask you is um, a lot of times people think that domestic violence means that the child has to be beaten physically or hit, and that's something that I've seen them ignore too. However, does it not affect a child I irreparably if a child is just in the atmosphere of domestic violence or in the atmosphere of drug, addi drug addiction? Okay, I would, I would call when a, when a father is abusing the mother, that's domestic violence. When a father is directly abusing the child, hitting the child, um, touching the child inappropriately, yelling and screaming at the child, I would treat that as child abuse. However, there is a, um, another consideration that domestic violence is really child abuse because when you hurt the mother, you're hurting the child. And child abuse is really domestic violence because when you hurt the child, you hurt the mother. And we're missing that connection. And it's very offensive to me, and I'm sure most of our viewers feel the same way, when, when it says it's a high-conflict type of a case and it's pushed off and CPS ignores it completely, which would be considered, it's di named different in different states, but Child Protective Services, uh, it's named different in different states, but um, they ignore it completely right away just because it's a family court matter. And also, it's very offensive to me because I have always just wanted to avoid domestic violence. I don't want to be somebody's victim. I wasn't put here on this earth to be somebody's victim, and neither were you. Neither were our children. So it's highly offensive when a judge just labels it, you know, under one umbrella, high conflict, and then it's completely ignored. Well, you when know, you're not perpetrating the high conflict. There are some child protective agencies that have actually had in their regulations... Um, words that suggest that don't take abuse reports seriously mm -hmm. if there's a contested custody case going on. Mm -hmm. It's improper and, you know, I think some have been corrected, but that belief is still common. And one of the problems, the, um, <coughs> the Saunders study recommends multidisciplinary approaches. You know, experts in mental illness or psychology have a role to play in the family courts because sometimes that's an important issue. But they are not experts in domestic violence and child sexual abuse. That's a specialized body of knowledge. And certainly the child protective caseworkers tend not to have that expertise. And they tend not to speak with experts in that field. You know, best practices um, based on the Green Book um, initiative for child protective agencies is that when they have a case where there may be domestic violence, they should work with a domestic violence advocate that they should cooperate and learn, and that will help them to recognize 
and respond in ways that are helpful for children. It's interesting that we are here in Rockland County, and Rockland County has had a really wonderful program um, between the Center for Safety and Change, which is the domestic violence agency here, and Child Protective, in which they work together, they um, cross-train staff, and when there's a potential domestic violence case, they will often bring a, an advocate with them. And that is best practices. Unfortunately, best practices are not often used by child protective caseworkers. And I think what we have with caseworkers, with judges, with lawyers, with evaluators, is that they believe they know everything they have to and so they don't seek assistance from genuine experts. And I believe there's a big difference between court-appointed court experts and real experts, but that's probably another subject. Um, well, I think, you know, the <laughs> point is that the people that the court appoints are experts. Here in Rockland, but, but not in Ulster. <laughs> but, but in what? Mm -hmm. right. They are experts no, in psychology. Right. They are experts in mental illness. Mm -hmm. If that were the real issue, they would be very helpful, and many times it is. You also have cases where the father has mental illness and he's abusive, and so they think that the problem is just his mental illness, and they'll focus on that. But if he didn't have a belief system that encouraged his abuse, mm -hmm. the mental illness would not cause him to mistreat his wife and children. And so we need two separate responses, one for his mental illness, one for his domestic violence. And a lot of the professionals that the courts use don't understand that. That's been very informative today. And would you mind talking a little bit about the Safe Child Act? Yes. The Safe Child Act is a group of best practices um, it's a comprehensive proposal that will dramatically um, protect children in a way that they're not protected now. And I'm working with the Stop Abuse Campaign to try to get the Safe Child Act passed um, in as many states as we can. Um, basically, what it does, the first priority is in all custody and visitation decisions, the health and safety of children must be the first priority in all decisions. Duh. <laughs> no question. I mean, that, that seems obvious, and when we meet with legislators, they are surprised that that is not the law. The problem is that it's only one factor, and courts are allowed to use many other factors and they tend to be factors that are less important to the well-being of children. Mm -hmm. But if we make health and safety the first priority, mm -hmm. then, you know, based on ACE, if a child is exposed to domestic violence or child abuse, that's going to be a health problem. That's more important than anything else. Um, if a child is, as you asked, taken away from the primary attachment figure, depression, low self-esteem, risk of suicide, that's a health and safety factor. Whereas alienation, which the courts tend to focus on, is not a health and safety factor unless it leads to taking a parent totally out of the child's life. The next part of the, um, ACE, um, I'm sorry, the Safe Child Act, is to require courts to integrate current scientific research, like Ace and Saunders and the Meyer study, it would require us to use a multidisciplinary approach so that we would include domestic violence experts and child sexual abuse experts um, in um, training and as ex expert witnesses. Um, we would also provide an early hearing that would deal with only abuse issues 
we, we, the standard abuser tactic of introducing all sorts of other issues to distract attention is eliminated. And um, by focusing only on domestic violence and child abuse, we know that that's going to resolve most cases, and we know the outcome. You know, the safe parent needs to have custody, the abuser needs to um, have supervised visits. And these are cases that now take many months or years that could be resolved in an hour or two. Absolutely. That's going to save enormous amounts of money, and we're going to get better decisions, and the children are going to be protected. And the other thing is training of judges and other professionals. And, and, and the thing is, what it really boils down to is really for the health of our nation on a overall, because this is our future. These are our future generations that are coming up, and they're coming up battered, you know, in some sense, emotionally, and so on and so forth, not just physically. So that is a major problem. This is everybody's problem. This is not just people who are part of family court. This is your problem. This is everyone's problem. These are, our, these are our children, these are our future of the United States, this is our next generation that are coming up. Um, I also feel being, you know, obviously we're pro-family, again, I want to emphasize that, um, with things being placed in the right decision making, that would, engage, that would enable domestic violence abusers to probably get better help for themselves, which I think would bring a healthier overall aspect to the family on a, on a whole. In other words, having them safeguarded, having them supervised versus the mother who is perfectly fine with a healthy background and non-criminal and, you know, I, I would have to say that just putting them into these positions, it would have to cause them to either sink or swim at that point. Either stop being a domestic violence perpetrator, stop doing drugs, and become something with your life, or, or sink. I, well, I would, you know, because you're now, you're now, put, put that in front of you now. You no longer can continue this abuse. Right. I mean, if you think about it, if you take a father out of a child's life, that's harmful to the child. Absolutely. We, we, we acknowledge that. that. Right. But if the father is going to continue to engage in domestic violence or other harmful behavior, mm -hmm. that's going to harm the child even more. Right. What the courts are doing now is they're pressuring the mother and child to accommodate their abuser instead of forcing the abuser to change his behavior if he wants a relationship with the child, which would be a win-win arrangement. That's, and that's really the goal, obviously, uh, long term. Um, if we could just hopefully get there. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to do. Barry, did you want to talk a little bit about, you have two books here, The, uh, the Quincy Solution and, um, and also uh, Scared to Leave, Afraid to Stay. Am I holding that okay? Okay. Um, Scared to Leave Afraid to Stay was my first book. If you see the picture, um, one of the clients who um, I wrote a story about um, painted that picture and had painted many pictures of forest scenes. And one day we realized that what that picture was showing is the path out of the violence. And so we had to have that on the cover. And this book tells the story of 10 of my clients when I was still an attorney who went through the system trying to get away from their abusers. And we wanted to show that there is a better life after being rid of the abuser. And I actually came to VCS for the first time to interview the director, Phyllis Frank, for this book. And that's how I started my association with the Batterer program. Um, the Quincy Solution um, is really an exciting um, book in my way of thinking. Um, I started by comparing the response to domestic violence in Quincy, Massachusetts, with the response in Poughkeepsie, New York. In Poughkeepsie, New York, they had a court system that was very much favoring abusive fathers. And there turned out to be a series of homicides in this small county, um, so that in less than a year, there were nine deaths, including five protective mothers 
and a um, police officer who had just rescued a child and the abusive father shot and killed the police officer. And the county legislature um, appointed a group of professionals to investigate the response in Dutchess County um, to domestic violence, and they found that the poor practices in the family court was a major factor in this series of homicides. Now, in Quincy, the original um, Quincy model occurred from the late 1970s to the mid-1990s. And Bill Delahunt, who was the district attorney there, noticed that um, the prisoners in a nearby um, high-security prison virtually all had a childhood history that included domestic violence and child abuse. And he believed that if he could prevent domestic violence, he could reduce all crime. And that's exactly what happened. Um, in a county that had averaged five or six um, domestic violence homicides, they enjoyed several years in a row with no murders. Other communities like San Diego, like Nashville, using similar practices had similar very positive um, effect with dramatically reduced domestic violence, crime, and particularly murders. And so I investigated that. We updated the successful practices in Quincy with uh, new research and new technologies and the Safe Child Act. Because what Bill Delahunt noticed was that victims stop cooperating with the district attorney when the abuser went after custody. That didn't destroy the success in Quincy because at the time that was a rare tactic. Today it's a standard tactic so that if we're going to prevent domestic violence, the custody court must be part of the reforms, hence the Safe Child Act. And what the dramatic breakthrough for me, I was not surprised that Quincy worked and Poughkeepsie didn't, but I interviewed someone who gave me a link to some medical research that found that in the United States, we are spending $750 billion, that's billion with a B, every year on domestic violence health costs. And what I realized is that's the incentive we need. Public officials who so far haven't been willing to do what's necessary to implement the successful practices of Quincy to save women and children from domestic violence might be interested in saving that $750 billion in addition to money from um, crime costs and the undermining of the economy when victims and children don't reach their economic potential because of our tolerance for domestic violence. And the, again, this is everybody's problem, whether you believe it or not, because it's their tax dollars that are funding what our judges are doing in our family courts across our nation. Um, so if that's where you want your tax dollars going, think about it. You know, give it a lot of thought and talk to your legislators. I've met a lot of great legislators, along with the ones that just, you know, close their eyes. But I have met a lot of great uh, legislators that we are working with that are doing their best and kind of shocked as we are that some of it hasn't moved as more forward as it should. Um, but I really want to thank you, Barry, today for being here. I know you have a huge fan base, <laughs> and I'm, they're all watching you now. If you want us to say a quick shout-out to your fans. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to shout-out. What I want to do is help us pass the Safe Child Act. Yes. The Stop Abuse Campaign is working on that. We need you to talk to your legislators. Let's get it passed, and let's start saving our children. Yes, let's save our children. That's what this is about. So thank you all for watching watching Punished for Protecting. Let's stop being punished for protecting. Let's work together. And also, if you'd like to uh, be on our show, if you want to be interviewed, uh, please contact me at 
www.punished, the number four, beingaparent.com. And thank you again, Barry. It's been great. Thank okay. you. Thank you.